It is 4.30, um, so I am going to go ahead and get this session started. Um, welcome, everyone. Before the session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference, the Open Education Southern Symposium, OESS, strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you are taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. So I am going to also drop a link to the full code of conduct in the chat here um, for anyone to review. And with that, the presenters may now begin. Thanks, Natalie. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gretchen Schranz. I'm a research and instruction librarian at the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. And today I'm co-presenting with the, our collection development librarian, Kayla Kipps. And um, our presentation is about uh, what happens when the funding dries up. We've been in the fortunate position of having a grant program for faculty to convert courses to OER. And we've been in the unfortunate position of having that program be taken away after only a couple of years. And we were very worried about that, but in the end, it hasn't been as bad as we thought it might. Be. So we're going to talk about how we've managed that transition. So um, we'll be talking about the grant program itself, and then the other things we've done to kind of fill that gap once the program went away, and the challenges and successes we've seen in um, promoting OER on campus and um, building a community of practice around OER. All right, so we had an, an incentive grant for two years. It was a, a pilot program. So we reached about 10 instructors in the first year and 18 in the second year. The second year coincided with the pandemic. So we did have a few who did not complete the program. Um, and the, the program um, gave them money to switch a course to OER. For the most part, they were adapting an existing OER um, textbook or other OER material or using some other cost-free material for students. So some faculty were using library eBooks. Um, the program was fairly uh, loose about defining what it meant to, to um, teach a cost-free course for students. Um, and we got this program. Our provost was very excited about it and saw that other schools were doing OER and um, felt that we should be doing it too. So in some cases, in some ways, there was more excitement about it than understanding of what OER exactly entailed. And um, fortunately, they came to the library where we had recently started a task force to discuss how we could support OER on campus. So we were well positioned to participate in those discussions. And we had a lot of input into how the program evolved um, along with some of our instructional technologists from the college. Um, and then the part that we had most um, control over was the faculty development component. So we designed and ran that, and that um, took the form of a course in our campus's LMS. So the participating faculty went through our de faculty development program, then they taught their course using OER, and then they submitted a report to the college. And we, I only have data, and it's not even complete data, um, for the first semester that, that faculty were teaching. Um, we only had seven courses running that very first semester that were definitely linked to the program. And we estimated that the savings were over $16,000 for students based on estimates of, of what the textbook would have cost. So we know that there are a lot more faculty using OER on campus than just reflected in that, but that was part of the grant itself. So unfortunately, then the program was stopped after the pilot program. We had a switch in administration, a new president, and a new provost, and, um, and then, of course, the pandemic. So the program did not continue after those two years, um, but not because it wasn't successful. We'll, we're, um, our new provost is very interested in OER and is proposing a new center for teaching excellence. So rather than have it be this isolated 
um, thing, it will become part of that other effort, which will be exciting. So we um, developed this course in our LMS and we built it on SUNY's OER community course, which you can find online. And it's a wonderful um, set of modules that are openly licensed. So we felt like it was a great way to demonstrate how uh, someone at our institution could incorporate and adapt an OER, um, OER curriculum into our LMS. It was an example of how to do that. So um, that also allowed us to set up discussion boards so that we could kind of have the self-contained group of faculty who could talk to each other and interact and engage. And um, as we knew that in order to be successful at this, we really needed to get faculty talking both to us and each other. And that's one reason that we chose to do it within our LMS so that we can have that defined group of, um, of folks. <clears throat> and we also relied on this framework designed for online education called the community of inquiry. The community of inquiry consists of three interconnected elements, teaching presence, social pre presence, and cognitive presence. So the teaching presence, as I just mentioned, was based on those modules from SUNY, um, and it was using OER to demonstrate how OER could work. And then the social presence were those discussion boards so that we could encourage cross-discipline collaboration and communication among participating faculty and to help them identify ways that their projects were similar, whether it was you know, figuring out how to set things up in our LMS, whether it was um, working on accessibility, figuring out how to make sure things were accessible for, their, um, for all students, and just other ways of sharing ideas. And then cognitive presence, that was where faculty were taking this back and applying it to their own course redevelopment. And uh, we did see a lot of this reflected in the themes, um, the themes that came about in their final reports. Um, those were coming directly out of our course. <clears throat> So the next slide, um, this is a quote from one of those reports. I found I was really able to create a course that was tailored to my teaching style, research, strengths, and students' needs in an introductory undergraduate course. And that was exactly what we were hoping for um, and just really nicely summarizes what many of our faculty were saying about how OER really benefited them. So that was really wonderful news because when the program ended, we were so worried that losing that stipend would be a disincentive to faculty who may have been considering OER, but maybe waiting for that next round of grant applications to really implement. And fortunately, that doesn't seem to have been the case, that faculty really are seeing benefits to, um, to switching their course to OER. Um, at CFC, faculty have a lot of independence over how they structure their course, and, and many of them are um, really tailoring their courses to a unique set of um, you know, um, instructional goals or circumstances. So many of them are still very interested, which is great news. Um, that the stipend really didn't matter as much as we thought it might. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kayla, who will talk a little bit more about what else we've done and, and um, how we're going forward. Thanks, Gretchen. So um, what really matters to, <clears throat> to faculty when it comes to choosing an OER for their course? Um, Gretchen and I have conducted several workshops over the past year with our faculty and have been collecting this data. Um, relevance and currency of content is very important, obviously, but so is cost to students, almost um, an, like, an identical amount. Um, so that's um, really nice to see when examining our OER and affordable learning initiatives at our institution. So as collection development librarian, I have tried to be as open as possible with our faculty members and promote not only the usage of library materials in courses, um, but to also encourage faculty members to request materials for us to purchase. So this promotes affordable learning within the scope of our existing materials budget. Um, so our instructional librarians are also really good at promoting these services as well, which is great for me because I do not always have that opportunity um, with as many faculty as they do. And um, we have sections dedicated to explaining how to assign library materials um, on our LibGuides. Um, we promote this on newsletters that are sent out to faculty periodically. And I think having this information available in many different places is important. Um, so we've used our LibGuides to really promote to faculty how to request those materials, how to assign them, and how to add those links to their learning management system and so forth. 
Um, we also emphasize to faculty to please let us know when they're using library materials. Um, and that's both for our edification, um, but also so that we can assure the faculty member that the level of access we have to that ebook, for example, is appropriate. So for example, a single user ebook found in the catalog probably shouldn't be assigned to a large lecture class. Um, but that access could be expanded if the library knows about its intended use. And this also gives us a better understanding of who's taking advantage of this and having a way for them to communicate that to us is important. And we really prioritize purchasing unlimited user ebooks to avoid this barrier altogether when we're able to. Um, in addition, the College of Charleston Libraries recently migrated to Ex Libris Alma and um, we're adopting Leganto, their reading list tool this fall. And this is another way the library is trying to promote OER and library materials to our faculty. Um, we hope that this tool will inspire more faculty to not only create reading lists, but to um, take the opportunity to further engage with OER options for their course materials as well. Um, even if it is just considering a chapter or two here or there before fully committing to um, a full transition to an OER text. So in the interest of continuing to build the momentum that the grant incentive that Gretchen was telling you about started um, and engage our um, campus OER community of inquiry a little more, um, we have also hosted multiple OER workshops offering stipends thanks to an affordable learning grant that was offered by South Carolina's Academic Library Consortia, Pascal. So this grant offered a stipend to faculty who attended an OER workshop and subsequently submitted a review of a textbook in the Open Textbook Library. Um, the stipend we hoped would entice faculty members to kind of finally take that time to really sit down and examine an open textbook, in turn, in turn perhaps getting more comfortable and familiar with using one. Um, the workshops have also allowed us to introduce OER to our faculty and show them more creative ways to use different types of resources. Um, such as library materials, um, freely available web materials, or materials they've created on their own, um, which is something our faculty in particular have been really interested in. And um, these workshops have been um, very conversational and enlightening for us. And um, looking for external grant opportunities among partnerships um, your institution is a part of may be a viable way to gain that financial backing or support for any initiatives you may be interested in at your own institutions. Um, initially, we applied to this grant um, to complement our incentive program, um, but now this is our most visible OER outreach since that grant was discontinued. And um, while we had the opportunity in this round to offer stipends, um, simply offering these workshops can be another way of engaging faculty. Uh, many of our faculty who attended did not submit a review, um, but they still did get the opportunity to learn and share their experiences with us and their colleagues. Um, in addition to the workshops, in the spring of 2021, we began an OER and affordable learning um, Yammer discussion group. And Yammer is something that's available from Microsoft Office that's used widely at our institution. Um, this Yammer group provides um, a public forum to engage with one another to discuss um, OER related things. Um, and the group has been used to share webinars. It's fostered some great discussion on OER tools, um, such as Jupyter Books that some faculty members are using in our mathematics courses. And the group is up to over 40 members now, and it's not quite as active as we hope it would be yet. Um, but we hope that it continues to facilitate conversations among faculty on campus as um, this community continues to grow. So where are we seeing progress? Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's for you, Gretchen. Um, yeah, so, so the next step is to figure out where to level up from here. And we do still see a lot of challenges. One of the biggest ones is that it's very hard to figure out what faculty and students are talking about and, and most interested in. Still, even though we're, we're getting there uh, and we've definitely been able through the course and through the Yammer group and our, our workshops to figure out, you know, identify some key faculty leaders on campus who are very interested in this and, and um, understand what they are most wanting. Um, 
just kind of getting that sense overall, especially knowing which departments are all working together and maybe interested in moving together towards OER, that is still a challenge for us. We um, also, are, many of the librarians are still working remotely. Um, and so that makes it even harder. We also, just before campus closed, I think about a week before campus closed, we had had a meeting with some student government rep representatives. Student government had, um, I think, initially been involved in um, getting the provost's attention to OER, and then um, there, you know, it, student government changes so quickly. A few years later, they weren't really involved anymore, and so we had just started talking to them again about, you know, figuring out what students are looking for and and how they can be partners and advocates. And um, and then that hasn't really gone anywhere. Hopefully, this fall we can pick back up there in our discussions with students. We know that um, again from Yammer in part that we have some faculty who would be really interested in um, self-publishing. We do not yet have a publishing platform like books or something similar. Um, and, and so figuring out a way to support those faculty without you know, adding cost is something that we're discussing as well. Um, Kayla mentioned we're trying to, to we're, we're getting better at knowing who is using library materials and our new reading list tool from Ex Libris is um, hopefully going to help with that as well as help us show faculty how they can pull all kinds of materials into their courses. But still, we're just trying to figure out what, what um, faculty are doing. We do not at CFC have anyone, uh, whether in the library or anywhere else on campus, whose job it is to um, support OER. It's not in anyone's job description yet. So um, it, it is a little bit tricky to you know, get in any kind of formal survey and, and figure out some of these questions. And so that's a, a lack of time for us as well as we know that it's a, an, a barrier for faculty as well to address that lack of time. And, um, and then also um, you know, other barriers for faculty in tenure and promotion, trying to get it recognized there and, and, and just all the things that we hear faculty say. So we are seeing places where we're having progress as well. Um, because of the pandemic, our library's acquisition policy shifted to become e-preferred. Um, so in the acquisitions department, we noticed the trend of more and more faculty requesting electronic materials like eBooks or quickly shifting their preference to electronic when we had discussions with them about the accessibility needs for materials, especially during the pandemic. And um, faculty who had print mater materials on reserves also reached out about replicating that access electronically. And many were actually specifically requesting new ebooks to be used in their courses. So in fact, since um, July 2020, um, faculty had identified a course that they wanted to use a requested material for 143 times. And that potentially provides access for hundreds of students across many different courses across departments. So this means that um, communication between librarians and faculty on campus um, using library materials is up and it could always be better, but it is up. And that's one good thing that COVID did provide for us. Um, and this helps us strategize with our faculty to help them choose materials that will work best for their purposes. And if we're able to finance them, that's really all the better. I mean, there's actually been a renewed interest in making sure that faculty who are using and developing OER in their classrooms are recognized for that effort, um, especially when um, we're considering tenure and promotion. Um, the College of Charleston recently got a new president, a new provost, and implemented a new strategic plan. Um, so it's very exciting to see what role OER can play in faculty development going forward. Um, and we're excited to continue this outreach and community building effort in this um, supportive environment and kind of see how our, our fellow faculty colleagues continue to advocate for themselves in this scope. So this is where we'd love to just take our pause and open the floor to you all. Um, please feel free to use the chat if you have any questions for us. And we'd also love to um, build our own community here and hear about how OER and affordable learning initiatives are going at your own institutions. I think we should be able to add the slides to um, Whova. 
I'll, I'll make sure those are in there for you. And I know we had one question that I just answered. What did you teach in the faculty development training? Um, and, and I had answered that in the chat. I posted a link to the SUNY OER community course, which is what our course was based off of. And I will put this in the main chat as well. It's in the FAQ, but I'll put it in the, the main chat. Elizabeth says, I love, really love the idea of creating a faculty training communication group in LMS. Um, thanks for coming to our talk, Elizabeth. Yes, one, one um, conversation that we had about that was whether putting it in the LMS was within the spirit of OER because we were um, adapting this and making our own new resource, but and we licensed our resource um, with a Creative Commons license, but it's not really shareable because it's tucked away in our LMS. So. Um, now that we have a Yammer group, we're, we've, we've discussed um, if we do evolve this in some way as part of our, our new Center for Teaching Excellence, you know, how do we want to keep it kind of protected or would we try to do something a little more open? But it has worked well for, for us so far. And we have another question. Um, we have not started any initiatives yet. How did you decide which librarians do what? So ours really came about more it came about formally in the form of a working group that was assigned within our library at the college. So we're on a affordable learning working group. Um, it's a couple of librarians and it's a couple of people from our institutional technologist office. And um, in terms of like how we decided to do what, that was really like an organic thing, really. Um, as collection development librarian, I tried to adhere to material requests that come in and try to do my best to offer that service to as many faculty as I can to help them in that way. And that's how I really got involved. Yeah, and then we had several research and instruction librarians who were part of that original task force. And I became invo involved partly out of personal interest. I had attended a couple of our, um, our statewide consortium had, had done some workshops and I had attended those and um, kind of indicated that I would like to be part of that initiative. So it, it was a mix of, of um, volunteering and being assigned I think, and figuring out, like Kayla said, it makes sense for the collection development librarian to be part of that, a part of that effort. Emily says, we've led faculty development trainings as well, similar in approach, to, in approach to SUNY's. Interesting to me to learn about how the stipend wasn't a big incentive. Um, yeah, I mean, we still don't really know how many people are doing it even without the stipend, but then the fact that people came to our workshops where we were offering a stipend and then didn't follow up with the review, you know, they, were, they weren't all that motivated by the money. Julia says, we have the same challenges you experienced, but we're starting a learning commons at our Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence that we hope will spur interest and involvement. Yeah, I'm really excited about that to see where it goes for us. Any other questions or comments? Thank you all so much for attending today, participating. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Kayla and Gretchen. This has been a really great presentation. Um, and it looks like we don't have any more questions coming in, but thank you again. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close out this session um, and hope to see everyone at the next session in a few minutes. Take care.